chapter 14 sticky notes starting on page 406. So the AP test sometimes on FRQs or even on multiple choice asks you to know how a person um, in a home could um, lower their water use. And so these are some of the ways um, that water use can be lowered in homes. You can always say things like low flow um, shower heads and low flush toilets and um, water every other day and things like that. But here are some others that you could see on the test. So um, rainwater harvesting. So some people around their homes get rain barrels and the rain barrels collect the water from the gutter. So when it does rain, it fills up a barrel it has a screen on top to protect it from mosquitoes and uh, from using that barrel as a breeding ground. <clears throat> and um, then you can use that barrel to water your plants. Another thing that can be done is in a home, um, new eco-friendly homes have two sewer lines. Well, not actually technically sewer, but two pipes um, for wastewater. One set of pipes goes from things like toilets and you can't really reuse that water until it's cleaned up in a wastewater treatment plant. So that's called black water and the toilet water goes to the wastewater treatment plant. But other uh, sinks in your house, other drains like your shower and your dishwasher and your um, washing machine is gray water and that means it's mostly soap. And so um, you can use that water then, um, because the soap is diluted a ton, um, to water your yard. And so you have a separate set of pipes that then go out to your yard and you use it. In California, we really should be doing that at all of our homes. And then there's xeriscaping, which is basically planting drought resistant plants to um, use less water. And this is kind of a big trend in California. A lot of people with the drought were ripping out lawns and replacing it with xeriscaping. Um, so another thing that we can do is we foolishly, in a lot of places, including California and Los Angeles, we clean up all of this wastewater. And most wastewater is not from toilets. It's from showers and sinks and laundry machines. And so there's very little yucky stuff in it, proportion-wise to the amount of water. So all of that goes to our wastewater treatment plants. It can be cleaned up to being almost pure and can be reused. So in Santa Clarita Valley, our reclaimed water, some of it is used uh, at Westridge Golf Course a lot of it, though, is sent to, um, into the river, which and then it's reused by the farmers for their orange trees along the Santa Clara River and um, through Fillmore and Santa Paula. In Orange County, they decided to stop dumping all of their treated wastewater into the ocean, and they now pump it underground, then pump it back up and clean it again and it goes through something like seven to 10 steps of cleaning. And some people call this toilet to tap, but it's not really. I mean, it's, it's this extensive, extensive thing to clean the water. And so when you go to Disneyland, that water is reclaimed water. Um, your ice in your soda is reclaimed water. And it's probably some of the cleanest water in the entire United States because of the extensive cleaning that's done, um, more so than any other place in the US. The space station has been doing this for a long time. Water is very heavy, and so they have to reclaim all of the astronauts' urine and waste and clean it up and reuse it again because it's, it will cost millions of dollars to haul up new water and haul away wastewater. So it has to be treated on the space station itself. 
On the next page, page 407, we have a picture here of Zara escaping. And this is done quite extensively in places like Phoenix and Las Vegas and more and more in Southern California. So the lack of water leads to political instability. They say that in Syria, um, it was an extensive drought that caused the civil war, which then led, led to the um, Syrian refugee crisis. And there's a lot of conflicts concerning water um, and its scarcity. It's a serious deal. All right, on page 409, so we have point source and non-point sources of water pollution. So a point source is you can point to it and go, that factory is polluting into the water. This sewage treatment plant is polluting. This animal feedlot, this oil tanker spilled. But if it's a bunch of little sources that kind of all mix together, like this house and this house and all of the pesticides and oil and grease come off, it's called non-point source. You can't point to a single house. You can't point to um, a single thing. And so we call this non-point source. So these are non-point sources and point sources. So make sure you know because questions on the AP exam will give you scenarios and they'll ask you which one of these would be a point source of water pollution or non-point source of water pollution. Okay, so in water pollution we have different kinds. We have toxic chemicals, we have pathogens and waterborne diseases, and we have nutrient pollution, which we've studied before. So in our nutrients, phosphorus, is a nutrient and if you have too much of that in your fresh water it usually causes eutrophication in fresh water whereas nitrogen usually causes eutrophication in the oceans and so that's just kind of a, a, a picky question but it's been seen before so you need to know which one usually causes eutrophication fresh water salt water here's a term that is not in your textbook but it's often on the AP exam, BOD, biological oxygen demand. And so if you have a nutrients, um, a lot of nutrients in your water um, coming from mainly sewage spills or a bunch of d things that have died, um, you will need a lot of oxygen for the bacteria to decompose the matter. And we call this biological oxygen demand. And so the questions you might see on the AP test would be like, um, you have a sewage spill into a lake, what kinds of things would follow? And so uh, one of the correct answers might be, there might be a high BOD to decompose the waste. Because remember, bacteria need oxygen to decompose, and so that's why we call it the oxygen demand. All right, so we have some pictures here of oligotrophic water and eutrophic water. So we talked before that oligotrophic water is nice and clear, no nutrients in it. Um, this is actually devoid of life. So we look at this as humans and we say, oh, how it's so beautiful and pretty. But in reality, it's not very much life. So it's pretty to look at, but not a whole lot going on in here. The opposite is eutrophic water bodies. And so in fresh water, you have a lot of plants that grow from nutrient runoff, including algae too, and um, plankton, freshwater plankton. But over time, this will fill in mainly from plant matter. And so a pond like this that's eutrophic will eventually actually fill in and become kind of marshy. Um, and then eventually land. Um, what you really want is you want something kind of in between these two for a healthy um, freshwater ecosystem. So on this page we have biodegradable wastes right here. All right. And anything that is um, know the causes and effects. So human waste is biodegradable, animal manure, paper pulp from paper mills, yard waste like grass clippings. 
Any of these things that get in the water, they have to be decomposed, so they have a high biological oxygen demand. And they, that bacteria decomposing these things will use up a lot of oxygen <clears throat> because of the high demand for the oxygen and therefore lower the dissolved oxygen into the sink. I'm sorry, into the lower the dissolved oxygen in the water. You need to know the definition of wastewater, which is basically all of our used water from toilet, shower, sinks, dishwasher. No sediments and how sediments um, are really important to, um, to a river, but too many can be sediment pollution. So here in Panama, you have sediments that have washed because of farming and construction. So a lot of soil erosion has occurred and washed sediments down here. So sediments can be a type of pollution as well. So you need some and preventing it like we saw in the case study on the Mississippi River can be a problem because your wetlands disappear but too many can cause problems as well. And then you need to know also what thermal pollution is. And so sometimes we have water that has been discharged, like from a nuclear power plant, or just a regular like coal power plant or um, a factory that uses water to cool machines. And if we dump that back into a river or um, a lake, then it can raise the temperature, which some species are very temperature sensitive and can only live in cooler water. And so that warmer water will cause them to either die or go away. Um, also, higher temperature water causes lower oxygen. It's just a physical property that warmer water does not hold as much oxygen. So let's talk about groundwater pollution now. The number one culprit of groundwater, oh, I forgot a D, I'll add that, of groundwater pollution is our underground storage tanks here, and they get buried. Think about a gas station. A gas station has the gas in underground storage tanks, and they can leak. So these would eventually be buried once they're built. Okay, other causes of groundwater pollution is sewage that seeps into the ground, or the sewage pipes leak actually is more of a bigger cause. So underground, if a sewage pipe cracks. Um, agricultural, like um, pollution, nitrates, pesticides, and bacteria from like uh, manure from feedlots, all of that can, can um, and does affect the groundwater. Groundwater pollution is very difficult to get rid of. You know, if it's a river, we can stop polluting it and wait for it to flush out. But groundwater, it takes a long time for it to flush out, and it can stay for years and years. It's very difficult to treat groundwater pollution. All right, so one of the ways that we have addressed pollution in our fresh water is through the Clean Water Act. And so these are the provisions you need to know. It's illegal to discharge from a point source without a permit. So a lot of times kids will write on an FRQ. The Clean Water Act says you can't pollute into a river. Well, actually you can as long as you have a permit. And so it's very important to specify that you can't dump into a river without a permit. You have to add that part without a permit or it's wrong, you don't get a point. We also um, set standards for industrial wastewater and for surface water contaminants. So all of our rivers and lakes have these thresholds of how much pollution they can have. And if they have too much, then the um, states and the government try and figure out how to get it below that level. And it's really worked to clean up huge amounts of rivers and lakes that used to be horrifically um, polluted. For little towns that could not afford to build a wastewater treatment plant, it provided funds to do that. And so now almost the entire country, every little town and cities everywhere all have wastewater treatment plants. So nobody's dumping raw sewage into a body of water like they used to. Well, it may happen on occasion, but dramatically, dramatically down. 